Hey you all, long time no see. I am back. Um, so if you haven't actually watched my last video that I posted, sometimes I post Bible studies, sometimes I will just randomly post a blog of my life. Um, I like to focus more so on the Bible because that's way more important than my life. But I did have a big announcement. So if you haven't seen that, I am pregnant. I have a little bump here. We are about 16 weeks. And so, yeah, I was like, I'm gonna be posting these videos every single week. And then I got pregnant and I got tired. And I'm like, Lord, give me the strength to continue to show up. I'm like, oh my goodness, are there any mom watchers? Because everyone told me like, you're gonna be really, really tired in your first trimester. I wasn't, I wasn't tired. This second trimester though, y'all, Oh my gosh, I struggle with feeling lazy and like I just need to get up and go. And I had a mom remind me the other day, like, no girl, this is the only time that you're gonna be able to rest when you feel like it. So if you feel like it, just rest. So I have been resting and the Lord condones that. He promotes us resting as well. So if there is anybody who can relate, tell me your mama stories um, or your pregnancy stories in the comments below. But uh, more importantly, we are going to be hopping back in the word today. I have missed this. I've missed experiencing this with you all. Um, I've gotten some amazing, amazing ministry opportunities um, with ministry at my church. And it's been so exciting. But this is like the first thing that I started to do. And so it's my first love and I miss y'all. So today we are going to be looking at uh, Exodus 1. And so I have some notes with me. I have my Bible. I've already prayed. Um, I've studied this material. I've looked at commentaries and notes and things like that. And so I just hope that I'm able to enlighten you in some type of way. If you've read this before, I hope you learned something new. But I want you all to join in with me. I want you to grab your Bible and read along with me. Um, so I'm going to be using the NIV. And this is the Journal of the Word Reference Bible. I use it every single video. And we are just going to flip to Exodus. And so if you've been watching my channel, the backstory behind this is we have went through Genesis and we last talked about the life of Joseph. And the very interesting thing about Joseph's life is he had very like so many ups and downs um, that he experienced, which honestly, I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. Maybe not to that extreme, but all of us have ups and downs in our life and we're wondering like, God, how are you going to work this out? But we learned about God's providence, even in bad situations, God can work them for your good, uh, Romans 8, 28. And so we see that personified in Joseph's life. Um, and specifically, Joseph's brothers had sold him off into slavery and he ended up in Egypt. And ultimately, he ended up working alongside the Pharaoh and interpreting the Pharaoh's dreams and telling him what they meant. And he foresaw a famine coming to the land. He said that there would be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. Um, and no one had any idea of this except for Joseph. And so Joseph was able to help the Egyptians to prepare for this and in turn, save Israel, all of Israel. And so we know that Israel is very, very important part of God's plan. And God made a covenant with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. He said that he would give him a people, a land, and a worldwide blessing. And so these people are important. Also, the Messiah is going to come through those people. And so we needed them to survive so that we could get to Jesus Christ later on <laughs> in the New Testament, right? The incarnation of Christ. And so Joseph was able to predict this famine, um, help them prepare for it, help them be saved. And in turn, his brothers came to Egypt. They were fed. They moved to Egypt. And so that's where we are in the story today. So there were about 70 people um, in total at this time that had moved to Egypt. But we see them multiplying. And we also see a new Pharaoh take over that Joseph means nothing to. So Joseph had, you know, interpreted the dreams of this previous Pharaoh. So he honored him. He honored him by position. He gave him, you know, a great position and authority in the kingdom, even as a Hebrew, even as an Israelite. However, that Pharaoh passes away eventually, right? And so people start looking at the Israelites a little bit differently. And so that's what we're going to look at specifically in the story today. So if you want to read along with me, 
Um, I'm going to start at chapter one, verse one again in Exodus. That's the second book of the Bible. And here we are. And it reads, these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. So Jacob is the father of Joseph. Joseph had 12 sons. Each of these 12 sons is one of the fathers of the tribes of Israel. That's why we refer to the 12 tribes of Israel. And they're all named after his sons. So we say like the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Judah, in which Judah, uh, Jesus comes from that tribe. So um, that's just a little bit of backstory. The 12 sons, the 12 tribes. So here they are. Uh, verse 2, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, God, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, 70, only 70 people. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So God is blessing them in this foreign land. They move here. They only have 70 people. That's it. And they become numerous and continue to increase. Verse 8. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Now, I have no idea why they made this assumption that they would just immediately join the enemies. But for some reason, their train of thought was, we are fearful of these people. And we see that happen so much in history. We saw that with the Holocaust, where it was like, there are too many of these people. We need to eliminate them. We see this with genocides around the world. Um, if you know what happened in Rwanda and so on and so forth. We see this with chattel slavery in American history, where we just see people fear people and so they try to oppress them and so that was their train of thought here we're going to oppress these people we're going to deal shrewdly with them and we're going to keep them in line because we don't want them to join our enemies which is a total thing that they've made up in their head that may not actually be the case it's just this made up scenario we're going to keep these people in line in case this thing happens sounds like a conspiracy theorist today right <laughs> verse 11 so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And that's just so interesting to me to read. God was still blessing these people, even though their circumstances on the earth was not the best, even though they were being oppressed and they were in these harsh conditions, God is still multiplying them. And there are things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives that just really don't make sense according to our circumstances. But when God is with you and God declares that you will be blessed, you will be blessed. Verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered, Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So pretty much they lied. Verse 20. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but every girl live. And so Pharaoh, we see at the end here, he takes it to the ultimate extreme and he says, OK, this isn't working. So this is what we're going to do now. Um, but there are so many um, interesting and amazing things that stand out in this chapter. One, the first thing is 
God is still with these people, even though they're being oppressed, even though they're in harsh conditions, they are still God's chosen people. And God promised in his covenant with Abraham that he would give him a people that would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And we can't count those. And so they're still multiplying. God is still faithful to his word. And so that can be encouraging for us even today. We may be going through things where we don't see the way out, but God's word says something specific to us and we can still have hope in it. We can still have hope in hard times and hard circumstances when we can't see what's right in front of us. Um, you all saw that I uploaded a video not too long ago about my internship just not working out and I was so disappointed that day I was so disappointed but literally by the end of the day I was like you know what it's fine I'm gonna trust God's sovereignty I'm gonna trust that it's just not his timing this may not be the thing for me I'm not sure um it may come back around in the future but whatever God has planned I know that he's with me. I know that he's providing for me. And I know that ultimately he's going to work it out for my good. Um, and then also, I couldn't tell you all in that video, but I was, I was, knew I was pregnant. So I was like, well, <laughs> I'm just going to be pregnant right now and not worry about it. Um, and so, yeah, we just have to trust God in the midst of our struggles, um, that he is still with us. We are still his children. Um, and he still shows up for us in major ways. Another thing that stood out to me was the midwives. Oh my goodness, the midwives, their faith. They feared God. Even though they were Egyptian women, they feared the Israelite God. Um, and in those times, it doesn't just mean that only Israel knew about God. There were other people, and especially with the Israelites moving into Egypt. So they feared God and they did not do what they were told to do which is huge because they are women at the time they are under the pharaoh's rule the pharaoh has given them a clear instruction to do something and they stand up and say no they they could have been executed they could have been killed for what they did but they chose to no i'm not going to do this this is not right i fear the lord and i'm not going to partake in this um and i thought that was amazing because all of us are in cultures right now, um, especially here in the United States. Um, I don't know where all of you all are from. That would be interesting. Another thing to drop in the comment box. Um, but the culture will tell you things that go absolutely against God, absolutely against his word. And it's like, are you going to cave to what the culture is telling you, what they're saying is okay? Um, what they are telling you to do, or are you going to stick with ultimately what God tells you to do? Yes, we honor authority, but if it goes against what God says, absolutely not. Um, and it's important for us to fear God above all else, to fear God above any man on earth, to fear God um, against whatever the culture is saying is right, whatever they're accepting, whatever they say is okay. We have to fear God first and foremost. And so that's a question that all of us can take away from this. Are we living our lives like we fear the Lord? Or are we caving into the culture that's being created at our jobs, that our boss thinks is okay, that our coworkers are thinking that it's okay? Are we caving into the culture that is rampant at our schools, what our peers are condoning and what they think is okay? Or are we sticking to what this word says and being guided by the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ has left within all of us as believers? Are we going with that or are we going with okay, well, they said to do this and they said that this is okay, but we know it's not in his word. We know it's not right. We have to always, always let the Lord have authority. And I just think that it's amazing that these two women said, no, we're going to let God have authority. We're not partaking in this. And ultimately, God was good to them and they were blessed because of it. Be obedient. Walk in obedience and trust that the Lord is going to be with you in it. The last thing that I wanted to point out is that we see that Pharaoh is strategically targeting these boys. He's strategically targeting males. He at first tells the midwives to kill the boys who are born. And then when that doesn't work out, he gives an order for every newborn boy to be thrown into the Nile and girls can live. And we see this kind of strategy um, all throughout many wars, even the wars that are detailed in the Bible. And why is that? Why get rid of the males? 
Is it because the males are seen as more valuable? It's because the males are the leaders. They are guiding their families. They are the protectors. They are the warriors. So if anyone's going to rise up and fight, at this time, it's going to be the men. Um, that's just the type of society that they lived in. It's going to be the men. And so let's get rid of the men and then it's going to weaken the people. And I just want to speak to that. Um, I think that that is something that is still prevalent today. I know a lot of people who have grown up in fatherless homes um, and who have suffered and just seeing its effect on society, broken families. And I just think of how the Lord, his intentions were for the family to be together in unity and how brokenness can really tear that apart and how he ordained them, the man to be the leader for wives to submit to their husbands, not all women submitting to all men, but for wives to submit specifically to their husbands. How when that's out of order and when Satan attacks that and takes the man out of the picture, it just completely turns God's plan upside down and weakens the entire society, not just one family unit, but if it's rampant everywhere, it's gonna weaken the entire society. And so I just think that that was something extremely important um, to point out because it's something that we still see affect families today. I read this super cool statistics in one of my classes. Um, I think it was like designing effective leadership ministries or designing and leading effective ministries, something like that. It had a really long name. Um, but there was a statistic in the book that we read and it was on how many members of your family are likely to you know convert to Christianity based on which member of the family joins the church first so if a child joins the church how likely was it for the rest of the family to come along and follow that child and there was a certain percentage I don't remember the number um, and then it was like how likely is it if the mother joins the church and then the rest of the family to you know follow her and do that and it was a certain percentage what struck me was the number for if the father joined the church for the rest of the family to follow him and come alongside him it was like high 80 slash 90 percent i remember that one because i was just like wow god designed this this way for fathers to be the leaders of their families and to guide them and so that's something that I think that we definitely need to embrace and that we need to encourage men in. Um, we need to raise little boys knowing that and prepare them to do that um, and not to repeat the cycles that they've seen in society because they're coming for they're coming for the boys and they're coming for the men and that is strategic. Like I said, I believe that that is Satan's way of just annihilating the family and in turn just flipping society upside down. And so, yeah, I hope that you all enjoyed this video. That is Exodus 1. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. I would love to engage with you in the comment box. And I cannot say I'm going to be back next week. I would love to say so. But y'all, this pregnancy, oh my gosh. <laughs> but I will definitely be back soon. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure you click the subscribe button. That way you get a notification when I post the video. <laughs> See you guys next time. Bye.